I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about lessons learned in a valley of dry bones. Lessons learned in the valley of dry bones. So as we look into the scripture today, it says in Ezekiel chapter 37, I'm going to read just a few verses and it says, the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley and it was full of bones. He caused me to pass by them all around and behold, there were very many in the open valley and indeed they were very dry. He said to me, son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. And again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked and the sinews and the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. He said to me, prophesy of the breath, prophesy son of man and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath came into them and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Father, thank you for your word, your word that is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Thank you for your word, O Lord, that is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Thank you, O oh God, that you're in this place with us today as we've sensed your presence. Teach us your ways. May we sense you and know that you're here. I pray, O oh Lord, you'll hide me behind the cross that Jesus be seen today. We love you forever. And everyone said together, amen. The Lord is good, amen? Let me give you some context and then we'll get right around in the sermon. Ezekiel was given a very daunting and heavy task that was to prophesy to the people of God who were in Babylonian exile in the land of Babylon. He had to pastor them and he had to minister to them and he had to prophesy to them. A people who were in slavery, a people who were in bondage, and he had to tell them the things of God. His contemporary Jeremiah was still in Jerusalem and is there that he was doing the same thing, but Ezekiel was there in Babylon with them. We look and we see personally that Ezekiel was approximately 13 years old when he began the process of the priesthood. His name, Ezekiel, literally means God has seized, or it can mean God has strengthened. But whichever way you look at that, the main part of that is this. For God to strengthen or seize, it means that the hand of the Lord is upon him. We look and we see that, that Ezekiel himself, according to Ezekiel 1 and 1, was a captive in Babylon. We see that he was married in 24 and 15 through 18. He was a man of great reputation, according to Ezekiel 8, 1, 14, 1, and 20 and 1. Not only do I want to look at him personally, but let's look at him professionally, known as the father of apocalyptic literature. The one who has the opportunity and the burden to declare that Jerusalem would be destroyed, Judah would be burned, and that they would be in a place of complete devastation. He had to declare the day of the Lord is at hand, and there was a day of coming destruction. He was a man professionally of great visions, Visions of chariots in chapter 1. Visions of a journey to Jerusalem in 8 through 11. Visions of dry bones in, ver in chapter 37 where we will be soon. And visions of a new temple in chapters 40 and on. Professionally, he was a man of symbolism. As in chapter 3, he eats the scroll to let us all know that the word of the Lord must be inside of us if we're going to do the work of the Lord. We see him shave his head and his beard and dispose of it by fire and dispose of it by sword and dispose of it by scattering, signifying that there would be a time of a fire that would remove the children of Israel, the sword would remove the children of Israel and that they would be scattered by the winds. We look and we see him digging holes through walls to preach. We see him cooking food. We see him even speak of his own wife's death in moments of symbolism. But I want us to look for a few moments at a prophetic look. There's three major sections in the book of Ezekiel. The day of the Lord, doomsday, chapters 1 through 24. The second section, he tells us to accept our fate, that there's nothing we can do except walk in this, in chapters 25 through 32. But thankfully, the Lord does not leave us in places of destruction, and he does not leave us in places of desolation, but there is always a place of restoration and redemption. And so that's where we come into chapters 33 through 48, which is where 37 is, right in the heart of these things to remind us that we serve a God who redeems 
and a God who restores and a God who finds us in midnight hours and in troubles that we may have brought on ourselves. but the restoration of the Lord is still good and is still pleasant and that he is still a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Aren't you thankful today for the restoration of our God and all of his miracles? So in chapter 37, we get to this place And the first thing I want you to see here in chapter 37, in verse one, it says, the hand of the Lord came upon me. And the Lord set me down and brought me out in the spear of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley and it was full of bones. The first thing I want you to see here is this, the place and the position that you are in is decided only by God. You see, as Pentecostals, we get excited. Can I just be myself? I'm just gonna unbutton and I'm gonna be Scotty. As Pentecostals, we get excited sometimes when we see that the hand of the Lord is upon me and that the spirit of the Lord has come upon me. And it's in that moment when we read those first couple of verses, there's that one Pentecostal that's already starting to stand up with their hands raised. You know what I'm talking about? They are ready to go because they've read the hand of the Lord is on me and the spirit of the Lord is with me. But notice right here, it takes a term that we really wasn't expecting because here's what it tells us. The hand of the Lord was on me. The spirit of the Lord led me. And look what it says it says, and he set me down in the midst of a valley. And it was full of bones. Verse two, he caused me to pass by them all. And behold, there were many in the valley. And indeed, they were very dry. Look at that place. We're excited and hallelujah, the hand of the Lord is on me. The spear of the Lord is with me. But then it says these words, and he brought me down. And he set me in a valley. And it was full of bones. And there were many bones. And he asked me to walk around in those, and they were dry bones. And what I want us to understand is this, that the position, the place that we are in in this moment, we have to understand and we have to believe that the same hand that was on me at the very beginning of this verse is the hand that's brought me to this valley full of bones. And the same spirit that was on me in the very beginning of this verse is the same spirit that is on me in this valley in these bones. So what are you telling me? I'm telling you that the steps of the righteous are always ordered by the Lord. And we may not understand the valley quite yet. And we may not understand the bones just yet. And we may not understand the season we're in. But here's one thing we can understand. That the Lord is with us according to the opening of the scripture in the valley and in bones and in trouble and in mess and in situations and I have good news for us today we're about to see the mess turn into his message and this test turn into his testimony where the church will be able to stand and say look what the Lord has done so the position and the place that we're in it is only decided by our God And if it is the Lord that has brought us to this place, it will be the God who will see us through this place. And so I've come to tell you today, if you're in heartache or sickness or disease, if you're on top of the mountain, if you're low in a valley, if you're in the middle of a mess or if you're on top of the mountain, I have good news for you today. There is one that sticks closer than a brother and his name is Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God and of his kingdom. There will be no end, hallelujah. Second thing I want you to see in this Second lesson is this, lesson number two, is that the Lord speaks in desolate places. Look with me in 37 verse three. And the Lord said to me, son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, oh Lord God, you know. What I want you to see in this passage is this, the Lord speaks in desolate places. It's very simple, but I think it's something we all need to hear and understand, is that God doesn't just speak on the mountaintops like he did at Sinai. And God does not just rumble on top of the mountains as he did when he gave the Ten Commandments. But there is a God that speaks in the lowest places of our lives, in the driest places of our lives, in the weakest moments of our lives. So here's the good news for you today. If you're on the mountain or if you're in the lowest place you've ever been, I have good news. There is a voice, hallelujah. And John the Revelator said it like this. It was a voice so big and so broad, I turned to see the voice that was calling out from behind me. How How big is the voice that you turn to see the voice? I've come to tell you there's no demon upon the earth nor devil in hell that can hinder the voice of God. For it is the voice of God that speaks on mountaintops, in dark places, in valleys, and in we're in trouble. Don't forget that it was the voice of God that said, let there be light. But there was no source of light created for three more days. But when he said, let there be light, light began to shine. I've come to tell you he is still the source of all things. He still speaks in midnight hours. He still speaks on mountaintops 
mountaintops. He still speaks in valleys. If we're willing to stop what we're doing, slow down and say, Lord, I need you. I need you. I need you. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Hallelujah. The Lord speaks in desolate places. The Lord speaks in desolate places. We look and we see the third thing I want you to learn here is this. In the same verse, the third lesson is this. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, oh Lord God, you know. A genuine, pure, and honest answer is all the Lord is looking for. A genuine, pure, and honest answer is all the Lord is looking for. So the Lord asked the million dollar question. Can these bones live? Now, all of us who were filled with the Holy Ghost, we would have already got our KJV up under our arm in a, in a little jar of Crisco if we couldn't find the olive oil. <laughs> Doing this right here. You better believe these bones can live because I'm about to name it and claim it in the name of Jesus, amen. You know what I'm talking about, right? All of us would have been there, right? All of you all. Anointing would have been dripping off of you. I don't know. What if we were in the same place? And, and I love Ezekiel's answer. It's genuine, it's pure, and it's honest. Only you know, oh Lord. You ever been there in life? You ever been there in the moment where you just weren't sure? That there's no hope in the dry bones. There's no hope in the valley. There's no hope in the mess. There's no hope because it seems to be digressing, getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Down, valley, bones, dry, walk around many. It's getting worse and worse and worse. Have you ever been there in life where it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse? The refrigerator quits, the car won't crank, your 12 year old is 13 and you do not recognize the animal that now lives in your house. You've got all of these things going on. It's getting worse and worse and worse. This is where the prophet is. And the Lord says in all of the chaos, can these bones live? And he has a beautiful answer, I don't know. I just don't know. I've been through so much, I just don't know. I've seen so many dry places, I just don't know anymore. I've been through so much mess, I just don't know anymore. Anybody had ever been there? I've seen so many hard times, it just doesn't make sense anymore. I've tripped over too many places, I just don't know. There's no hope in the dry bones. I don't have hope in this situation. But he's very specific with his answer. He says, oh Lord God, you know. If you get nothing else, get this right here. Your circumstance does not have to dictate your faith in God. It may dictate the faith of what you're going through. And you may wonder if you're gonna make it. But if you will not allow your circumstance to dictate your faith in God, here's what you'll be able to say. I don't know, but here's what I do know. I know that you're the rock of ages that was cleft for me. And so I'm going to hide myself there until you come to rescue me. I may not know the answer to your question, but here's what I do know. My Redeemer lives, and so I'm going to believe because my Redeemer lives. I may not can answer the questions if the bones can live or not, but here's what I do know. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. I know who you are even though I don't know what's going on. And here's what I do understand. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is to be praised. And so right here in this place where the bones are dry, where I seem to be going under, where it's not getting better, I'm going to stand to my feet and I'm going to declare that if God be for me, who can be against me? I'm not going to let my present circumstances dictate my faith because here's what I believe, that these present and light afflictions, they last only for a moment, but they're working out for me an eternal weight of glory. I may not know the answer if the bones can live, but I can tell you this, I do know the answer and his name is Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God and upon him I can depend. Hallelujah. Your circumstance does not have to control your faith. Your circumstance does not have to control your faith in God. For here's what we understand the psalmist said. He said, if I take the wings of the morning and fly out of here, you're there. Or if I ascend in the pits of Sheol, into the pits of the, you are there. No matter where I am, here's the good news. You are still Jehovah Shammah, the Lord who is there. In the mountain, you're Jehovah Shammah. In the valley, you're Jehovah Shammah. On the, on the mountaintop, you're there. In the valley, you're there. In healing, you're there. In sickness, you're there. In trouble, you're there. In victory, you're there. Wherever you may be, here's good news. Oh, Lord God, you do know. Hallelujah. So fourthly, 
Once you give a firm answer, an honest answer, don't be afraid to be honest with God because he already knows your heart. You know, we all grew up with that. Well, you just don't need to question God. You know, I think it's okay sometimes to look at him and be like, what in the world are you doing? Anybody ever done that before? This doesn't make sense. I don't get this. If you shed some light, I'd appreciate it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? All of you more sanctified than I am because I do that occasionally. The rest of y'all looking at me like, he might die and go to hell for saying that. Amen. I won't because God knows the thoughts of my heart anyway. It's whether I say them out loud or not. And so this is where Ezekiel is. He's like, I don't know, but Lord, you know. So I'm gonna obey. So the fourth lesson is this. Obedience will always yield a blessing. It just does. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, obedience will yield a blessing. Did he not say in Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy, if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord, I will bless you in the city, I will bless you in the field, I will bless your going, I will bless your coming. But if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, then I'll put all the curses on Egypt on you. Obedience always yields a blessing. When Jesus tells the man, take up your bed and walk, he had to obey to receive his blessing. And so it's in this place that we're about to learn in lesson four is that obedience will yield a blessing, verses four through 10. And again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live and I'll put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin, put breath in you and you shall live. And then you shall know that I am the Lord. I'm almost finished, give me just a couple more minutes. It's in this place the prophet has a decision to make. Do I obey the Lord or do I just sit here in the mess? Do I obey the Lord and speak to these dead things, these dried up bones, or do I just wallow in my mess? In the 21st century American church, we just like to wallow in the mess. Well, it's just been so bad. You just wouldn't believe how bad it's been. You wouldn't believe, every time I turn around, it's getting worse. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Ezekiel would have never made it out of the bones if he was in the 21st century American church. He'd have been like, I got bones all around me. I just don't know if I'm gonna make it or not. There's bones everywhere. It's not KFC bones, it's not pork chop bones. I don't know, I got, I got bones everywhere, amen. <laughs> but we have a decision to make. Am I gonna obey the Lord or am I gonna wallow in the mess? But I've come to remind us today, we're the head and not the tail. That we are the sons and daughters of the living God. And we do not have to wallow in the mess that we are in. And so Ezekiel had a decision to make. Do I speak to these dead bones, these dried up things? Or do I just wallow in the mess? Listen, people that talk to themselves, they're in one class of psychotic. People that answer themselves are another class of psychotic. And people that speak to dead things, that's a whole nother thing right there in the name of Jesus. Amen. Do I do this and everyone think I'm crazy? Do I do this and everyone thinks I'm strange? Listen, that's what we as Pentecostals are. We're strange. But God does great things with us. I got a mama that takes pictures off of her wall and lays hands on them and prays for the people in the pictures. I'm like, mama, they can't feel it. She said, no, but God can hear it, amen. And he knows who I'm praying for and I jerk his picture down, amen. We anoint cloths and send them to the sick. We do strange things that people don't understand, but God hears us. And so Ezekiel had a decision. Do I obey the Lord right here or do I wallow in the mess? And so Ezekiel makes the decision. I'm going to obey the Lord. I've come to tell someone you have a decision to make this morning. You can keep wallowing in what you've been dealing with or you can finally get what my mama would say and say, I'm fed up with this. I'm fed up with the gates of the enemy. And I've decided today that I'm going to take peace and joy and love and mercy and grace back to my house. And we're not going to deal with this stuff anymore because as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Lord. So Ezekiel finally obeys the Lord and through his obedience, the Bible says, so I prophesied, I spoke, I preached as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and a rattling and the bones came together bone to bone. As I looked, sinews and flesh came upon them. The skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. But all of a sudden, through his obedience, he has seen a blessing. The things that were dead and separated are coming back to life. And he's hearing this great noise and he's seeing the rattling. But there was no breath. But the Lord wasn't finished quite yet. 
So I've come to tell you in the middle of your miracle, you've got to push on. In the middle of your miracle, you've got to keep going. Thank him for what he's done and where he's brought us from, but God's not finished just yet. So keep pressing on through the mark of the high calling of God that is in Christ Jesus. He says, but I noticed something. There was no breath in them. And he said to me, prophesy the breath, son of man. Say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath came into them and they lived and stood on their feet an exceedingly great army. His obedience of prophesying, of speaking, caused dry bones to come together and caused breath to come inside of them. The breath that said, let there be light and there was light. The breath that rattled on Sinai's mountain and thundered. The breath that blasted and the Red Sea opens. The breath that blew into the nostrils of Adam and <gasps> Adam breathes and becomes a living being. The breath that whimpered in Bethlehem's manger. The breath that said to the little girl, little girl, rise. The breath that took the bread and the fish and break it and tells the disciples, now go feed them. That same breath is blowing in Ezekiel's army. The same breath cried out, it is finished. The same breath that cried out, it is finished. The same breath that said, I'm having to go away, but I will pray to the Father and he will send another comforter who will come and abide with you forever. The same breath that blew in an upper room in Acts chapter two that said there was a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind that filled the house and they who were there had tongues of fire that came and sat upon each of them and they began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gives the utterance. The same breath that will say, come up hither. The same breath that says, I am the first and the last. The same breath that says, I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. The same breath that declares he is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The same breath that called you by name is blowing through Ezekiel's army in this day they begin to live that's the thing about the breath of God it causes dead things to live again and so if it's your marriage or if it's your children or your grandchildren or if it's your mind and it's depression trying to take over if it's sickness heartache or disease let me remind you of the breath of God that will blow right there where you are in the middle of the valley that you're in and things will begin to happen your sea will begin to part the marriage can be together the children will come home again I've come to tell you the spirit of the living God the Ruach of God is blowing on the earth in the 21st century if we simply will say, breathe on us, O Lord. It's through his obedience that they receive this blessing. And lastly, as I'm closing, you know, every, every good preacher gets three times to say in closing. I learned that as a little boy. They'd say, in closing, I'd start gathering up my stuff. 30 minutes later, I've got my Nintendo back out. Amen. <laughs> so I've only used it once. I'm keeping a mark on it. There's one statement made 65 times in the book of Ezekiel. The last lesson that you, I want you to learn is this. One statement's made at least 65 times, around 65 times in the book of Ezekiel. And that statement's been made three times in these 14 verses 37, one through 14. It's made over and over and over. A theme of the book of Ezekiel, a theme of the story of the dry bones, a theme of the vision, a theme of the dry valley. In, 13, in 37, six, it says these words, I'll put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 13, then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened up your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. Verse 14, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it. What are you telling me? Lesson five is this. Sometimes we go through things and sometimes we go through valleys and dry places and heartaches and trouble so that when we come out of this thing, we'll be able to say, I know him as God of the valley now. He's not just Mama's God or Papa's God. 
He's not just my spouse's God. He's not just my mama's God or my daddy's God. He's not just the pastor's God. He's not just the Sunday school teacher's God. But I've been through some stuff. I've been through some mess. I've had some hard times. I've dealt with some dry places, but can I tell you this? I found him to be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Can I tell you this? In my sickness, I now know him as the God who heals me. In my depression, I have found that he takes my depression, my oppression. And I can tell you that weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning because now I know he's God. I've been through some stuff, but I didn't go through that stuff alone. No, no, no. Now I can sing the song of the old church and I can tell you, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there no other has ever known Dr. Cornette it's been worth every mile cause now I know him my way Anna, it's been worth every mile because now I know him as the God who heals. It's been worth every storm because he stood on the end of my boat and he declared, peace, be still. So the lesson I want you to learn is this. You can know that he is God. You can learn that he is God and that this God will never leave you nor forsake you, but will be with you always, even to the end of this age. Stand to your feet all over this place.